uh, seminar series uh, talk from Greg Delory. Greg's coming to us today from uh, UC Berkeley where he's a faculty member. Uh, he's uh, been doing work on electromagnetic sounding. Uh, he's going to talk today about field test results uh, of an instrument that he eventually hopes to have on the surface of Mars. Thanks very much, Greg. That's a good start. I like thinking about this on the surface of Mars. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I, I work at the Space Sciences Laboratory at UC Berkeley. We're sort of an instrumentation heavy group. Um, we fly a lot of instruments on terrestrial orbiting spacecraft and on some planetary. And uh, water on Mars became a real interest to me uh, when I was kind of looking for some things to do back in 2000. And we had just had the Mars Climate Orbiter and Mars Polar Lander reset on the program. Uh, some of you may remember a conference held at LPI in July of 2000 was Concepts and Approaches for the Future of Mars Exploration. And it was there that I was first introduced to the whole theme of follow the water uh, and, and then how that theme reaches into a lot of different areas of, of Mars and planetary research. And it just made a lot of sense. I thought, wow, if I could find out a way to tap into a measurement that would characterize water on Mars, that would be very exciting. Uh, and so that's one of the impetuses that led me down this particular path. Uh, I'm a physicist by training, so I'm going to talk in terms of fields and connectivity and electrical stuff, uh, so please bear with me. Um, there, there's a, a wide variety of individuals involved in this project besides me. Uh, and so as far as the geology and geophysics goes, uh, Bob Grimm at Southwest Research Institute is uh, my partner in crime. Uh, I've also worked with uh, up-and-coming research and development companies uh, that are doing a lot of DOD work in electromagnetic sensing and trying to leverage that kind of technology. It's at Quasar Federal Systems with Tom Nielsen, uh, co-eyes at Goddard Space Flight Center and also the Army Research Lab, uh, uh, given their experience in electromagnetics. So what I'm talking about today, as the title says, is an electromagnetic technique to detect the subsurface liquid water. And it's important to put the word liquid in there because we randy the term water about quite a bit uh, and half the time or more than often than not we're talking about ice. I want to make it very clear we're talking about water in the liquid state. And uh, when people ask me why this is so important, you know, at a cocktail party, I mean, I, I hope it's obvious to this crowd, wouldn't you just love to have a, you know, one cc of Mars water back here for analysis? It seems very obvious. Uh, is, that, is that cubic centimeter of water sterile? I doubt it. Uh, it'd be an interesting scientific find either way. So that's one of the things that motivates me, uh, certainly the role of water in astrobiology, but also in Mars climate history, uh, the question of where the volatiles went, uh, the sources and sinks for those processes over time. So here's the, the summary. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a low frequency electromagnetic sounding technique. And I'll try and define what we mean by low frequency. Uh, one definition is it's a lot lower than radar, for example. Uh, and in fact, contrasting this technique with radar is an important point of uh, important part of the talk in terms of getting the point across about the power of this technique. So what this amounted to, uh, in summary, was developing sensitive low frequency electric and magnetic field sensors that are placed on the surface of a planetary body and they measure the components of electromagnetic fields that are horizontal. Okay, so there's a small horizontal component of fields as they interact between an atmosphere or the space above a surface and the subsurface. And it turns out you can derive all kinds of information about the subsurface to a given depth by monitoring those fields. Uh, it's an established technique called magnetotellurics and it's used here on Earth quite a bit in uh, natural gas and oil exploration and also uh, detecting depth to liquid water. Uh, so we developed these under a planetary uh, instrument definition development program and then were funded later under the Mars instrument development program uh, you know, at the sensor level and then integrate together into a, a, a standalone package that uh, self-contained and had everything it needed to run autonomously uh, in some type of analog test environment. We also integrated it with a rover and then we found uh, our definition of a Mars analog field uh, site, which I'm guessing is a lot different than the definitions that other people in this room might have, but uh, those differences are instructive, and I'll go into that. And the end result was being able to penetrate into the subsurface by over a kilometer and to derive the conductivity structure of what the subsurface looks like. And why is that important? It's because water is conductive. Uh, it, it's one of the clearest signs that you hit 
wet material, water saturated material is by conductivity. And so this is very sensitive to subsurface water. A uh, quick review of where we think we might be with water on Mars. Um, this is a model that is, I'm not going to argue for or against, but it's here as really an, instruction, an instructive example of why one would consider low frequency techniques on Mars. So this is one conception, okay? Uh, and that is that Mars is essentially locked within uh, this thing called the cryosphere, which is a few kilometers to maybe 10 kilometers thick in some areas uh, or more. Basically, a frozen upper layer of crust uh, at some depth, making reasonable assumptions about the surface temperature and the heat flux from the planet, that water is going to melt. And, and the question is, what is that depth uh, and what are the different forces that uh, control it? Um, so the prevailing thinking being that if there's water on Mars today, it's probably at some depth. Uh, if you just go with a simple cryosphere model, uh, it's kilometers thick, although there's other evidence that there may be shallower pockets of activity. Still under debate. Uh, but the point is, in broad scale, ideally, if you want to find liquid water on Mars, uh, you're looking at kilometer penetration depth uh, type activity. And that's the other problem, is that that's a model and that's what we actually know. So as an experimentalist, I want to go to Mars, verify different models, uh, and this is certainly one technique that could help do that. Uh, this picture isn't quite right. Uh, because the radar is starting to tell us something about the first few kilometers in the, in the north and south pole uh, where radar has been particularly successful. Uh, but by and large, you know, the upper 10 kilometers or so I think is still a really open question uh, for what the structure is. And even if you're not interested in water, uh, the technique that I'll describe could reveal a lot about that upper 10 kilometers uh, experimentally. So it's, I'm sure it's clear to everyone in the room uh, that there's plenty of evidence for water in the past. Um, the Valley Network features, geochemical uh, and, and geological features, the Jerosite concretions. Um, I think this har hardly needs belaboring. Uh, the question being, again, where did all the water go? Um, and you know there are various different theories about that. One is that it sequestered into the subsurface through various processes. Uh, there's another school of thought that says volatiles were lost to space uh, through impacts or uh, other processes that erode the atmosphere over time. Okay, so the gullies are interesting, uh, especially since there may be some indicators that there's recent activity. Uh, it, it's fascinating that we've been at Mars long enough to, to see some of these changes. And if you have uh, activity near these features, which may be windows into some type of subsurface aquifer, uh, and you see changes, perhaps that's an indicator that there is subsurface uh, water activity. Again, not uh, confirmed, still under debate, but there are tantalizing hints that uh, the subsurface of Mars may be active in some way. If so, water is certainly one good uh, possible explanation. This is you know, an, an older result, but I think still an important one. Um, in that we have pretty good evidence, obviously, from the neutron and gamma ray spectrometer results that there's a fair amount of water ice in the upper meter uh, of the regolith. And the real question here is, is this just indicative of some type of water uh, surface atmosphere exchange, some kind of condensation cycle uh, with climate drivers, or is this the tip of the proverbial iceberg and you know, sort of the tip of a, of a vast frozen cryosphere? Um, not really understood. So let's talk about electromagnetic sounding methodologies. And the one that, that people are most familiar with is radar. Okay, So radar is a, a time domain sounding technique. Uh, you propagate an electromagnetic wave, you get a reflection. Uh, and it has a lot of advantages. You can do it from orbit. Um, you can control the signal. Uh, and you get high spatial resolution. Uh, you have some things that you're you're working against, and that's ionospheric modification, which has certainly turned out to be a problem for Marsis. Uh, and the other thing is, is just how radar discriminates subsurface materials. Uh, radar discriminates by dielectric constant. And so when you consider uh, a material, when you consider the electrical properties of materials, you can break them down into two basic uh, regimes. One is their conductivity. One is their dielectric constant. Dielectric constant is more indicative of how bound charges wiggle 
when they're exposed to an electromagnetic field. But conductivity describes the motion of free charges okay, uh, through that material. So radar is, is primarily uh, a dielectric constant discriminator. So you, you understand the structure of something by looking at changes in dielectric constant. And the radar has been great at looking at the, at the polar layer deposits uh, and the north and south pole uh, ice cap structure. Um, there were some buried features at, uh, and I still need to revise this, there's some buried features at, at equatorial latitudes, but I think it's turning out that those were uh, more than likely ionospheric effects. Uh, so I think that's in, really in debate. Um, the other interesting result from the radar is that the penetration and absorption of a signal is, is really consistent with uh, pure water ice that's, that's a little more pure than they expected. And they can tell that by the attenuation of the signal of depth uh, to some degree. As far as liquid water goes, uh, even before the radars were going to fly, uh, they really pulled back from the statement that they could actually detect liquid water, and, or at least unambiguously. And why is that? Again, it's because you're looking at changes in dielectric constant. And the, and the changes in dielectric constant vary by about an order of magnitude between different materials, so water, rock, loose gravel, etc. Uh, you don't see a huge change in that particular electrical parameter. Conductivity, on the other hand, uh, changes drastically with just a little bit of water, especially if it has uh, some salt component, as, as most water will in, in uh, geophysical environments. So one asks the question, if you're really after liquid water, let's focus on conductivity. So that's where a low frequency electromagnetic technique comes into play. Um, in radar regime, you're dealing with electromagnetic waves. They're, it's what's called propagated behavior. Okay, So this is described by the standard wave equation. You launch a wave. Part of it reflects off the surface. Part of it is transmitted into the subsurface. It still propagates as a wave in the subsurface mostly. Uh, and then is reflected back depending upon uh, discontinuities and dielectric constants. So imagine the subsurface is a bunch of different barriers with different wave reflections happening. And you get depth information by looking at the time domain of those reflections. Okay. Um, now, let's lower our frequency down, okay? So we're, we're wiggling the electromagnetic fields more and more slowly. What starts to happen? Uh, it starts to happen, it starts to influence charges in the material in different ways. So instead of wiggling an electron in place, you're actually pushing them through the material. And the ease with which you push them through tells you what the conductivity of that material is, okay? But to do that, you have to go down to low frequencies because if, you, if your frequencies are too high, the electrons act like they're still bound. They jiggle in place as opposed to move in a, in a DC way. So uh, one, is, one is sort of AC and one is sort of pseudo-DC, although you're still using uh, waves to do this. So basically, uh, inductive electromagnetic sounding counts on the fact that incident electromagnetic energy on a planetary surface will induce subsurface currents. And then it's measuring the response, the waves generated back by those currents that tells you what the conductivity structure is. Here's a way to visualize it. Um, this can be a difficult message to get across. I, I keep trying to come up with one, one chart that does it, but uh, in any event, let's give it a go. Um, Above a planetary surface, okay, if you have any electromagnetic energy around, uh, it's propagating as waves and it's interacting with the surface, as you can see there on the upper left. Uh, so part of the energy ref refracts, reflects away and part of it refracts into the subsurface. The problem is that when, once it gets into the subsurface, conditions are different. You're no longer in an atmosphere or a vacuum. You're in a material, okay, uh, that has a much higher electrical conductivity than uh, what's above the surface. And so that means that the wave energy dissipates very quickly through these DC currents I've been talking about. So an important concept here is called the skin depth. Okay, And the skin depth, an easy way to visualize that is if you have a, a radio wave hitting a piece of metal. Okay, Radio wave will have a very, very short skin depth in the metal. As soon as it hits the metal, it starts moving around all those masses of electrons that are free in the metal and dissipating energy very quickly. It stops the wave in its tracks. The same thing is happening <coughs> in, the, in a planetary surface, <coughs> but instead of the, uh, the wave skin depth being microns or nanometers, it's kilometers, okay, because the conductivity is higher than what's above the surface, but it's not that much higher. So the, the end result is that uh, higher frequencies, the, the, the skin depth is frequency dependent, so that higher frequencies lose their energy very quickly, and low frequencies are able to penetrate 
much more deeply into the subsurface in terms of the secondary currents that they generate. So you can imagine this in an incident wave kind of falling off exponentially in power as it comes in, and that profile is going to change with frequency. Uh, the end result is that if you have connectivity structure, uh, in this case we have a resistive layer over a conductor that's going to alter the way as a function of depth that these waves dissipate energy. So it turns out, if you sit down with Maxwell's equations and you work this all out, you get this thing called the apparent impedance, okay, which is literally the, the resistance of the subsurface as it appears from the ground. And you do that by measuring the orthogonal components of electric and then it field at the surface. Okay. And you form the ratio of those uh, in that equation down there in the lower left. Um, that gives you the connectivity profile as a function of frequency. And because frequency is related to depth, you can invert that structure to get what's called the connectivity depth profile. Now, some of these solutions are non-unique, as a lot of remote sensing measurements are. However, uh, we have a lot of terrestrial experience in, in geophysical prospecting in which to rely, and there are ranges of reasonable values for terrestrial materials that you can use as constraints. And when you put those things together, uh, most depth soundings can be reasonably constrained. Forgive me, Greg, yeah. maybe a stupid question. What is your measuring? You're measuring the electric. Ah, okay. You're you're measuring the fields at the boundary condition. So let me try and explain that. Uh, you you use boundary conditions in Maxwell's equations, okay? And what those boundary conditions tell you is that no matter what the waves are doing above and what the waves are doing below, at the uh, air boundary interface, they must satisfy a boundary condition. Okay, and those boundary conditions are the following. Uh, the electric field, the horizontal component electric field is, is continuous. So it's the same for the wave above as it is for these dissipating currents fields below. All right, and the magnetic field uh, usually just goes right through the surface. It's continuous as well. Yes, you are. Yeah, you, you need to be on the surface. Very difficult. Yeah, that's right. And so that's an advantage of something like radar has, is that you, you're shooting at something, okay? In this one, you're, you're lying on the ground and you're quietly listening, okay? Um, and you can probably take a reasonable sounding within uh, a skin depth scale height above and below. Uh, you know, some sensors are buried and, and there is some airborne uh, media to tolerics that goes on. But the best measurements are right at the surface. Is there some practical lower limit to the frequency that the works at? You bet. Yeah, and that's an important design consideration, and depending upon your circumstances, there are different limitations. Uh, so I can, I can elaborate on that uh, as the talk goes on. Millihertz frequencies are relatively standard, so, you know, thousands of a second, and that can give you anywhere from 10 to 100 kilometers in penetration depth, depending upon subsurface conditions. It's been done, uh, and and the the issues are you know what what you have available for your signal. Uh, so let me plow on, and I can elaborate on that uh, from from a number of different perspectives. So this says in graphical form what I just described that once you arrive at this connectivity structure, you get this apparent resistivity curve. So this tells you what connectivity is as a function of wave frequency at the surface. And because the skin depth of different waves is frequency dependent, you use an inversion algorithm to derive uh, connectivity as a function of depth. Okay. And uh, here's an example. Uh, two models. Model A, you've got a, a conductor over a resistor. Okay. And you can see as a function of uh, frequency, you see a dip uh, in the connectivity. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, and, and dip in the resistivity um, at a certain frequency, and that's where waves are hitting uh, a particular conductive feature. And uh, here you have a, a resistor over a conductor, okay? Uh, and then you see the opposite effect. So let's see, let me make sure I did that right. So model A, yeah, so you see resistive uh, over conductive. Make sure that makes sense. This is frequency. This is this is shallow depths, right? So you see lower resistance for model A, okay, and then for model B, 
you see uh, lower resistance of depth. So you can see these ones are opposite depending upon the layering of those two features. So the, the analogy obviously is that water is a conductor. So imagine one of those layers is water and, and you see a clear signature um, in the resistivity spectra. When you say water, you mean liquid or ice as well? No. Nope. The advantage of this technique is that ice acts like what I described earlier as a dielectric, which means that it sees right through it. Uh, it's sensitive to liquid water, and that's the real power of the technique. And that's why, uh, if you do believe that Mars is this locked into this cryospheric shell, uh, your penetration depth through the cryosphere should be very good, because there'll be very little loss, as there is with the radar. And then, as soon as you hit liquid water, you hit a gold mine of, of induced currents, which bear itself out in the data. The other interesting thing about this technique is that it uses natural electromagnetic signals. Um, and so you don't have to bring anything with you. Now, on Earth, we've got plenty of examples of how these are generated. And the two most common are solar wind, magnetosphere, and ionosphere interactions, okay, which cause perturbations uh, and waves uh, that have to do with the Earth's magnetic field um, and the field line geometry, and uh, plenty of atmosphere electricity. Uh, in the form of lightning, and I'll show you some interesting lightning data later. Now, Mars is uh, a different case. Um, it does not have a global coherent dipolar magnetic field, but it has isolated magnetic anomalies. It has an ionosphere, and it's sitting in the solar wind. So there is going to be some kind of electrical activity. We just don't know what it is. Uh, but uh, magnetotelluric is not going to care. All you need is uh, electromagnetic energy going into the surface, and as long as it uh, is around long enough, and common enough, you're not going to have an issue. Now, atmospheric electricity is another, another question. Uh, colleagues and I have looked quite a bit at uh, dust dynamics and dust charging. It's an open question whether or not uh, dust, the motion of dust and the frictional charging of dust could lead to any large-scale atmospheric electricity, but it's a good possibility. Uh, it would be surprising if it didn't. Again, I think it's a question of, of the power level and the frequency range and not uh, whether it exists or doesn't. Um, here's an image that drives that point home. Uh, the most violent atmospheric electrical discharges on Earth are in fact associated with volcanoes. And, and that's an example of a, a frictionally charged, what we call triboelectrically charged system. Um, so the atmospheric pressure on Mars is a lot lower. Potentials probably can't build up to these catastrophic events. Uh, maybe it's a slower glow discharge. We don't know. But the point is, is that, uh, you know, as in the case of other natural source sounding methodologies like seismic, for example, uh, it's a pretty good bet that the planet's going to give you something to work with. It'd be amazing if Mars was completely electromagnetically quiet. Uh, so here's an instructive uh, uh, plot about the terrestrial electromagnetic spectrum to give you an idea of what we use for our field tests. And then you can imagine what might happen on Mars. Uh, the geomagnetic band is the solar wind ionosphere interactions I talked about earlier. So you can imagine these really slow undulations in the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, that produces a, a wave-like structure, which uh, goes through the ionosphere and impacts the ground. And you can use those for the lowest frequency sounding. And this goes down to 10 to the minus 2 hertz, so 10 millihertz. Although if you wanted to go down even lower, there's plenty of geomagnetic activity at lower frequencies. Uh, if you really wanted to go low, to answer the question about you know the maximum depth, Way down here, at a period of about a day, there's this thing called SQ, which is a, a thermal response of the ionosphere. And because the ionosphere is charged, its motion generates its pulse every day as, as the Earth rotates across the terminator. Uh, and so that's actually one big whopping signal you can use uh, for the deepest soundings. That's not common. This is the lightning regime. Uh, and, and this as well. So from about a hertz on up is, is purely what they call the spheric band. Uh, lightning uh, events throughout the, uh, the world. Uh, our instruments pick up activity from, from the thousands of thunderstorms that are worldwide at any one moment. Uh, it's, it's a great uh, sounding source. So for Mars, we're not sure. Uh, hopefully I've given you enough motivation to consider that it's a strong possibility. Yeah? What do you need a narrow band signal? To no, it's best with a broadband. Yeah, and, and most of nature's sources are broad. Uh, it turns out, with, with rare exceptions. And you can see the power line and VLF transmitters, which are man-made, are the only narrow band uh, features there. So 
Actually not, because the, the thing that you care about is not the absolute levels of the electric and magnetic field, it's their ratio. So it, it's self-controlling in that way. Uh, and that comes out of the boundary conditions of the Maxfield equations, and that's really the power of this technique, is that it's self-normalizing. Uh, the, the problem would come if you're measuring one of those components incorrectly, for some reason, you know, an instrumental issue. Uh, here's an example of some of these waves. These are called Schumann resonances. So imagine lightning uh, going off all over the world, okay? And the, the surface of the Earth and the ionosphere form a concentric waveguide. So you've got a, a relatively conducting Earth and you have a relatively conducting ionosphere with an insulating atmosphere in between, okay? All these lightning strokes go off and they generate electromagnetic energy. And what happens is that all that energy gets focused into resonant modes, okay? And waveguide cavities are, are well known in engineering applications. You build them and use them all the time. Uh, the Earth is one big natural waveguide and it turns out that the normal mode starts at around 8 hertz. So you go out and you measure the electric field that's being produced by the Earth and you'll see a clear oscillation at 8 hertz, you know, peak of at a factor of 2 above background. And that's one of these modes. Uh, this could very easily exist on Mars. There's been two theoretical papers on this uh, at least. The resonances are different, but uh, the general idea is the same. Just an example of a more interesting one, and, and this is an important band at, at uh, around the hertz and 10 hertz bandwidth for, uh, for subsurface sounding. So how do you do this? Uh, and this is how you've been doing it in the past. You, you buy some equipment, you, uh, you lay down uh, a magnetometer horizontally on the surface or you, you, you bury it uh, to give uh, you know, good spatial stability. And then you set up long wires of little voltage probes in the end and that measures the electric field by taking the potential difference between two different points on the surface. And for the electric field measurements in the past, you've had to bury them. Uh, they have a special chemistry that lets them electrically couple you know, to the soil to get the best possible measurement of that electric field and just the layer you know, between the, the soil atmosphere boundary. Uh, you have a data acquisition system and a computer. Um, fairly large scale deployment. Uh, it's not uncommon for electric field measurements to be a kilometer long, for example. So if I can summarize my predicament uh, in one chart, this is it. Uh, you want to take something that, that has sensors that are five, six feet long, takes several people to carry around and use things like shovels and you have to rent big trucks to a small landed autonomous package that you could send on a Mars mission. Okay, that's really what we're, what the Mars Instrument Development Program was funded to do. So we want to do a magnetotelluric survey on the surface, uh, starting with that. So well, the first thing we set out to do is to revolutionize how electric field measurements are done. And I came at this from the uh, space and ionospheric and atmospheric perspective, where we've developed electric field sensors for decades. Um, our approach is to forego the fancy chemistry and to come up with a completely solid state electronic solution. Uh, it turns out that a lot of the problems that people have had in getting a good voltage measurement at the surface uh, in which they've solved through chemistry, you can actually dream up or think up or engineer uh, an electronic circuit remedy as well. Uh, and that has to do with you know, measuring small currents, things like input impedance for those of you who are, are uh, electrically inclined. And this is what we came up with. Uh, it does make contact with the surface through these, these short cleats. Those are about half an inch long. Um, but it doesn't require very much contact. You can literally just plop these down without thinking too carefully about where you situate them. And they will measure very effectively uh, the voltage between two points. And the other thing we wanted to do is to shrink the size that you needed to, to get these things uh, separated for an adequate measurement. And I mentioned hundreds of meters or maybe sometimes a kilometer in previous measurements. Uh, we got these down to 20 meter separations, which is something that one can just about visualize uh, perhaps for a Mars mission. Uh, same with the magnetic field sensor. Uh, you, the, I showed a, a plot earlier, of an image earlier of a long white coil that was about uh, five feet long. Uh, we get the similar sensitivity in, in a device that's 18 inches. Uh, and this came out of a, a, a DARPA program, actually, because uh, the military likes magnetic fields, too. Um, and, the, and the key is to have sufficient sensitivity to measure these natural fields. Uh, and that's what we achieved in this, in this instrument.
so we put this all together into sort of a, a pseudo landed package. Okay, this uh, is about 16 inches wide and 6 inches tall, and uh, the uh, data system power and a transceiver was in the central package, uh, and then we have the the sensors uh, connected up to it. Uh, although you know you do have to de deploy the sensors, and so we were funded to do the, the data acquisition and autonomous operation. Um, we didn't tackle completely the deployment problem yet, but we did build the sensors so that they could easily be deployed. Was really our goal. So this is what it looks like when we're actually using it. Uh, again, there'll be some way to deploy it, and it could be a, a rover, it could be an autonomous uh, deployment system that shoots the probes out, uh, such as one that was developed for Netlander. And uh, that's about the, the footprint we would leave, 20 meter separation of the, the voltage probes. The magnetic field sensor uh, just needs to be kicked out you know, one or two meters to get away from near field noise. Uh, and again, that's also a, a very similar approach to something like Netlander, um, which did a lot of pathfinding work and, and how to deploy geophysics measurements to begin with. So we kind of took that for granted to some extent. So here you're measuring the horizontal uh, components of the electric field by taking these potential differences, and then you have a self-contained uh, 3D magnetic field measurement uh, off by its lonesome. Not exactly, no. Uh, you do have some uh, uh, variability there. Uh, you know, they could be off by 10, 20 degrees in each direction, and it wouldn't uh, overly impact the results. Now, uh, when we've talked about doing this on missions, a camera's a good thing to have. So we've always had imaging uh, to get you know the after deployment result uh, as a possibility, and uh, NASA uh, during the review, the last review we had for the MIDIP program, got really excited about this being a rover assisted project as well. And of course, there you have a lot more uh, controllability. Great. Yeah. Why the difference in the arm lengths between the Yeah. Uh, let me go back to that. So let's talk about how magnetic field sensors work. A magnetic field sensor is, is a coil, okay? So you're measuring basically changes in currents in this wire coil caused by changes in flux going through the coil. Uh, and so it's, it's by definition compact. It can be very big to get higher sensitivity or, or different frequency response, or it can be very tiny. But the point is you can do it all in one spatial area. Okay, now, electric field, is is very different. Uh, a potential measurement has no meaning unless it has a reference. Okay, so if I say that you're at five volts, um, you should say back to me, well, I don't care because you didn't tell me five volts with respect to what. So if I say you're at five volts with respect to your chair, you know, then there, you know there's a potential difference between you and the chair. So the only measurement that has meaning for electric field is potential difference. Okay. Um, potential is measured in volts, and electric field is volts per meter. All right. So um, if you measure ten, if you measure a voltage over a meter, okay, uh, in the presence of an electric field, and then you measure the same voltage over ten meters in the presence of the same electric field, this measurement is ten times greater. Uh, you're measuring the same thing. All right, but because you have a, a wider spatial distance in this potential gradient field, you see a larger difference. So it comes down to signal to noise. All right, and that's the reason why the earlier uh, surveys uh, use very long baselines for the electric fields because they get volts potentials. Okay, and we're dealing with uh, potentials that are sort of 100 microvolts uh, when we shorten up the baseline. So I hope that that gives you a good picture uh, of why. And, and this is really a key part of the technology development. This is the thing we had to lick to get this to work. So I assume that's why you couldn't replace those wires with a wireless. Yeah, it'd be a nice world if we could. Uh, you know, that, that comes up, uh, surprisingly, and, and I, I found myself thinking about it out of frustration <laughs> occasionally. Um, Is there some way you could bootleg it by having each of those deployed units have several probes close together and do the differential measurement there, and then you'd have a bunch of gradients and, and interpret like that? And get Possibly. Uh, and, and there have been various incarnations of a, of a mass network deployed formulation for this kind of survey. Uh, and there's actually a well-established analogy with the magnetic field, and it's called magnetic radiometry. 
Uh, and so you, you can do the same game with magnetic field in which you look at the gradients in the field to derive the, the structure of subsurface currents. Uh, nobody's tried it with the electric field, as far as I know. So um, I'd have to, to do some more thinking about that. That would depend on what the scale of the variations are. Is it smooth over? Yeah, in, in magnetic field, it's very, very uniform. Uh, and so to do magnetic radiometry, you need typically a kilometer or tens of kilometers or even 100 kilometer scale deployment. Um, electric field is, is very sensitive to what's the local sounding that you're doing. And so you do see a lot of changes uh, depending upon where you, where you move it. Okay, so here was our system in action. Uh, we just wanted to get a, a prototype noise floor test. Uh, and to do that, we went just to an environment that, that wasn't geophysically like Mars, uh, but uh, was, had quiet electromagnetic uh, properties. So there wouldn't be a lot of what we call cultural contamination, i.e. no power lines, no transmitters, uh, fairly isolated. This uh, particular measurement is at the Anza Borrego uh, dry lake bed. Uh, the first thing to find out is that a dry lake bed is anything but dry. Uh, it's extremely wet underneath. And that led to very low overall signal level for our electric fields in particular because the fields are sensing a conductor right near the surface. They're just almost shorted out. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a good uh, test to get our noise floors figured out. And we also um, tested operating it um, via a remote uh, ground support equipment interface uh, through a wireless transceiver. So we tested its ability to operate uh, you know, with a remote user uh, as if you're at mission control. Uh, we also played around with rover integration right here at Ames. Uh, it was one of the requirements of the program, and we only had a few days to do this, but we explored various ways that this could be a rover payload that would get dropped off and then uh, subsequently deployed. So the real pay dirt is uh, getting to a place that would, uh, I hesitate to say simulate Mars, but be more Mars-like than most of the Earth. The, the problem we had in testing this device is that the Earth is awfully wet. Uh, there's just water everywhere, which means that you know our penetration depths in those environments were 100 meters or less, and we had really tiny signals uh, for the electric field in particular, you know, because of that, that conductive media. So we wanted to find a place that had an extremely dry, resistive subsurface, and it'd be even better if there was a conductor underneath that resistive subsurface. Why is that? Because if if our thinking about Mars is correct, you've got this dry, resistive cryosphere, and I say dry because it's frozen, okay, so from the perspective of low frequency waves, it's a dielectric in the way, and the waves you see right through, and then you may have a layer of liquid water underneath. So uh, our question was, does any environment like that exist? Uh, Bob Grimm, uh, my geophysics colleague, uh, searched far and wide and, and came up with things like Antarctica, and, uh, you know, Devon Island was no use to us, by the way, uh, you should find it interesting to know. Um, and, and as, a, as a preview into you know, how our definition of, a, of an analog site differs maybe from a lot of yours. Uh, but it turns out that there's a feature in Idaho um, in the Snake River Plain region, uh, which is a young basalt flow. And the young part is important is because basalt is relatively resistive. And if it's young, it hasn't had a lot of time to get broken up and modified over time. So there's a there chance that you'd have this thick slab of resistive stuff. Okay, uh, and then there was also an aquifer system. Uh, the Snake River Plain aquifer system is legendary for its uh, ability to provide water to the region. So we had a real chance of seeing a conductor underneath uh, this feature. And we settled on a test area uh, that was to the east of Craters of the Moon National Monument, uh, south of Arco, Idaho. What a place. Um, and here's a, a geological survey uh, this is a cross-section of this lava flow, basically, and the vertical scale is enhanced here for clarity, so it doesn't really look like this from the side, obviously, but um, you can see this really deep uh, lava flow feature, uh, uh, quaternary basalt primarily, and it goes to depths of, uh, this is 6,000 here to 1,000, so at least 5,000 feet. Um, in depth, uh, and then there are various aquifer systems at shallower depths uh, interspersed around. So we picked one that was sort of on the edge of the deepest area uh, to try and get, uh, really test out our deepest penetration depth. So that's our Mars analog site. Doesn't look like Mars, but again, the important thing for us 
It's what's in the subsurface. Uh, we don't care what the surface looks like. So we got shrubs, we got all kinds of stuff going on that is completely uh, geologically irrelevant except uh, what's going on a kilometer below. So we deployed our sensors, took some measurements, and this is what the measurements look like. Our system operated from about 1 hertz to uh, 20 kilohertz, and um, that gives us a depth range of a few kilometers to uh, maybe 10 meters. Um, here are the Schumann resonances. Here are those peaks I talked about. These are lightning strikes. And you put those together. You get a resistivity curve. And in our case, uh, we're seeing, um, let's see, high frequencies. Sorry, wrong side. High frequencies are shallow. So we're seeing conductors at, at uh, shallow depths, which is probably rain and you know, other uh, contaminants. Then we hit the big resistor this big thick resistor and then we see a conductor at depth and if you invert that this is exactly what you get this is a, a layer of young basalt and then we see drops in conductivity as we get beneath that uh, you can use various arguments in, in terms of temperature and pressure and porosity uh, to derive where liquid water most likely exists and our conclusion was about here and we were able to compare it with a survey in our area that matched it up you know within about 10 to 30 meters, depending on where we are. Uh, so since time is getting short, I'll, I'll take questions on that interpretation later. Um, we've simulated this for Mars. Okay, so again, back to Mars, you've got a thick cryosphere, groundwater at depth, and here's what it may look. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. Why is the, uh, no, the, the, that one, because the details of the structure are mimic uh, both boundaries. Is that just Artist, uh, rendition, or is there some reason that this you know, the same? Which part? On the left? Right, yeah, I'll be honest and say I'm, I think that's rough topography data. Right, but you would think it would be random and no mm -hmm. correlation over that distance. Uh, correlation with, uh, with what? With yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't speak to that. Uh, this is the Clifford et al. paper. Um, and, and again, the main purpose of this is, is to, to get across the analogy of ice and water, and conductor over, over I'm sorry, resistor over conductor. He's just using the set depth to unsaturate right? Yeah. Again, assuming a thermal flux and, and other uh, parameters, uh, salinity of the water is also important. So uh, taking the system on Mars, you know, you'd get resistivity curves that look something like this. Uh, you'd see these inflections, which indicate the depth to uh, a conductor. And again, a conductor is a euphemism for what is very likely liquid water. Uh, and you can see there are vast changes in the resistivity structure, depending upon whether you have an aquifer or uh, no liquid, for example. So it's, it's very diagnostic uh, in terms of, of what you're seeing in the subsurface. And this is in a paper by Bob Graham in 2001 outlining um, you know, how inductive techniques will work on Mars in general, not just MT, but also other methods as well. So the conclusion is that we have a mechanism for deep subsurface exploration. Uh, and you can do it from a small uh, deployment. And because it's passive, it's low in power. Uh, it's exciting because it's liquid water. Uh, we could probably discern liquid water from depths of uh, 50 meters down to 10 kilometers uh, if we increase our, our penetration depth by lowering our frequency, which given our system is actually fairly simple to do. Um, if, if you want to know more, there's actually a really great summary on magnetotoric applications uh, in EOS Volume 88. Um, and I just want to point out that uh, Berkeley is also involved in one of the Mars scouts that's looking at the other end of this in terms of water escaping uh, from the atmosphere. So we're trying to look at this from, from above and below the atmospheric column. You bet. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, and not only that, Europa exists in an extremely electrodynamically active environment. But the Jovian system is one big uh, generator and engine. Uh, and so you've got whopping signals 
um, and and the perfect setup of an ice layer with possibly an ocean underneath. And in fact, I've thought of going to an ice sheet, you know, for that reason. I mean, I know it'll work. It's more of a demonstration. Uh, and I'm glad you brought that up from another perspective. In that, in, in a sense, we've already done an inductive sounding of Europa, and that's the magnetometer measurement uh, on Galileo. Uh, that uses the same basic physics. Uh, you're looking. You're, you're making the argument that the rate of current dissipation indicates a conductor at depth, and that's exactly what the magnetometer does. It has the advantage, though, or, or disadvantage of being only one uh, uh, point. But if you look at uh, how the Jovian magnetic field changes periodically, that's like your signal. And then you look at the delay between the response of the moon's field in relation to that one, um, and it's the time domain version of many of the tellurics. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are going to have different conductivities. Uh, and so uh, the, the pore space issue is, you know, how, how connected is it? Uh, you know, the geometry of the pore space itself will also have a big bearing on, on the bulk conductivity. Uh, so, so there are some issues there. Uh, we'll see the tank of water. That'll be obvious. Uh, but where it gets difficult is, is when you see, okay, well, it's not a tank of water. It's water-saturated something. And um, the, the details of the porosity and what the state the water is in are going to be what you argue about. As soon as it comes up in the oil Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm much less familiar with the, you know, the geology of oil uh, or, or its dynamics and the subsurface. Um, you know, it, they use this as one of the most effective techniques. Uh, and do they use the, the low frequency coming atmosphere? They use it all. Uh, and they also use active sources, too. Uh, there's a whole different uh, approach that you, know, you bring your own source. Uh, and they combine that with seismic. Um, but again, oil is a good example because it's, it's a conductor. So it's, it's really easy to find using this technique. Um, related question, what about a, um, I guess call it a slurry, a mixture of ice and water? Sure. Yeah, I would ask though over what scale that would persist. I mean, I think you would expect that in the cryosphere melt boundary, for example. Um, you know, not being a glaciologist, uh, I'm not sure. I think that salinity would also have an equal bearing as well. So I'm not making the claim that we can uh, unambiguously identify the state of the liquid water. I, I can say with pretty good certainty that we'll identify where the bulk of the liquid is. Um, but yeah, what, what you get out if you stuck a drill in, which, which I think is where this is ideally leading, is, is still open to some debate. Uh, but the, the point is, is that it's, it's a hell of a lot better than radar. Even, sorry, what, one follow-up. What about a uh, deposit of, of iron or copper or something? Uh, it still won't approach the conductivity of water. Uh, the water is at least four or five orders of magnitude more conductive than, than most other known um, subsurface materials, yeah, given common geology. Um, yeah. So you don't think you'd be able to detect them then? You can. Uh, it, you'll, you'll see a, you mean that uh, ore deposit? Yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll see a conductivity profile with different features in it. Uh, and, and those can result from different combinations of materials. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity there. Um, you'll, you'll know that there's something there at a layer. I mean, it's very much like radar from that perspective. Radar senses dielectric changes. How do they tell it's ice and dust? Well, you know, you have to bring in some other parts of the equation. Um, so another point to make is that this is an extremely good technique to use in concert with other geophysical techniques. So if you combine uh, EM with seismic, okay, uh, they both approach the, the problem from different physical parameters, one acoustic and structural and the other electric, and that can be very powerful in helping to resolve that. But water is the most unmistakable, and that's why really that was our focus. Uh, also, just the excitement of, of the role of liquid water in, in astrobiology and understanding where to drill. Uh, I mean, maybe you guys have figured it out already, and I'm wasting my time, but... Uh, Is 
It's completely passive. Uh, if you're measuring, if you have any, any active component in your system that you're measuring, that's called noise, and, and you've screwed up. Uh, you need, in fact, we spent our time tracking down that. That leads to positive feedback uh, and, and bad news. Now, uh, however, you could take that system, the receivers we built, and place an active VLF transmitter a mile away and use it just as well. Uh, it, it's not, it, it, it's EM wave agnostic. It doesn't care where they come from. Uh, but it has to be some source external to our instrument. Oh, the subsurface. Yeah, it, it can, but, but by itself, it's not completely discriminatory. Um, so, and, and you're faced, when you talk about composition, you're faced with a similar problem. Uh, that radar faces and that the contrast and connectivity between similar materials is small. Okay, it's really the conductors that stand out, like water and like a few other things that are very rare. Um, so again, you want to combine that with some other technique, and seismic is one that comes to mind. Uh, so you can you can triangulate on the electromagnetic and the in the acoustic and maybe one other property, and you can get a bunch of geophysicists together and argue for a year. You probably come out with a a. Uh, Conclusion: We did manage to match up most of our transitions and connectivity to borehole surveys that have been done. You know, so we're seeing the boundaries. Okay, we don't always know what they mean. Great. Is there any confusion from the signal spreading out to the side of the instrument? Um, yeah. You yeah, you have. Well, you don't want to. You can't eliminate it. You have a footprint that's proportional to your baseline. Um, so you you accept the fact that. Uh, you're, you're getting a bulk measurement over a certain spatial scale. Now, ways to alleviate that, uh, you do a closely spaced survey. Okay, so if you were doing this on Earth, you'd pay your grad students to pick up the sensors and walk them 500 meters one direction. Um, the, uh, the, the orthogonal components of the field can give you some degree of, of inhomogeneity, you know, in terms of the azimuth. So that, that can be uh, of help, especially when there might be one sort of rift discontinuity somewhere in the system that, that can lead to a large asymmetry in how the subsurface responds. But in general, if you're not doing a walking survey, you take what you get. You know, you just admit to yourself, this is our this is our box. In, in the box at the moment with that setup uh, that you have in testing how wide is it Oh boy, that's uh, can I answer that off the top of my head? Um, it's going to depend on depth and on the separation of the sensors. It's also going to depend upon what other discontinuities exist around the sensor. So, you know, there could be a change. Uh, yeah, I, I can't give a clear answer. I have to think about that. I mean, ideally, you want this thing to be able to pick everything up and move somewhere else. Ideally, yeah. Again, you have to remember. Um, the scope of the question we're after, and that's primarily the liquid water question that we examined. If you're after a much more detailed geophysical survey, then yeah, uh, this by itself in, from one single station is not, is not the answer. On the other hand, uh, from one station without moving it, you can find depth of water. And so that, that's where the advantage lies. Whereas many other techniques need an orbiter or, or multiple stations. That's as, as long as you're over that boundary. Sitting on the surface somewhere. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, site selection for something like this would be interesting. It's a whole different set of variables that um, we'd have to adjust to. I have an engineering design question. Okay. The casing around your system is always much gold stamped in that. Are you talking about dust getting inside that? Yeah, we were, and we had a microfiber screen sandwiched in between the holes. Uh, to do that. We did that for cooling and to keep the dust down. Uh, it didn't always work. Dust is, I also studied dust. It gets everywhere. Uh, so you'd have a different solution on Mars. This is purely for terrestrial case when you've got convective heat transfer wind. Um, you mentioned that you have a Dependent on what material you have to go through, is there anything that we think could be in Mars that would like really mess your depth? 
So we've, we've modeled that based on what we think we know about the subsurface of Mars. And, and it's, it's as simple as a, a more resistive surface gives you a deeper penetration depth because there is, there are less, there's less dissipation in currents as a function of depth, so the wave can go farther. If it's highly conductive, it shorts out you know, in a shallow depth. So we think that everything we've done here could probably go a few more kilometers or more on Mars. And that's, that's really, now, now what kind of issues, quote, mess this up? Um, if you had a highly conductive layer in the upper centimeter, okay, uh, that can lead to something called static shift. Uh, and and it's, 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 sh it's so shallow that your model doesn't know that it's there, it can't invert it, and yet you're seeing its impact in terms of much reduced penetration depth because you're losing so much energy in this narrow layer. That can really get you. There's, there's two answers, and there's one that, which is NASA ease, and that's we're at TRL six. <laughs> Uh, for people who know what that means, uh, you know the the, the leading uh, measurement for geophysics is seismic. Okay, uh, and and this that's been the baseline part of every geophysical mission, and we we have two things to do. One, we have to convince people or not that the water question and that understanding the the detailed structure of the upper few kilometers of the crust question is important enough to include this, uh, get it on the radar screen so to speak. So that's really one of the impetus for the work. Uh, from a technical perspective, uh, really there aren't that many worries. Uh, the main thing remains the electric field measurement and getting good coupling uh, for those voltage probes. And we're not the only ones to face issues like this. Uh, I mentioned the Netlander radar, which had explosive deployables that towed 30 meter cables out for their ground penetrating radar. We would look at something similar if we had a rover we could use that. A rover would solve all the problems if we had a rover with us. And then I'd say there are no technical difficulties. Um, if we're completely autonomous then we'd want a, another research program I think to really get the voltage probes uh, uh, designed much more versatile and rugged you know, uh, casing and, and coupling properties. Okay, so we'd like to, uh, I mean, 